we talked a little bit about the stiffness and compliance tensors. So the, let's say, this and compliance tensors. Uh, this, this pen is not dark enough. So if you remember, we have now this is a general relationship for stress and strain. Um, we have an epsilon is equal to S sigma and uh, sigma is equal to C epsilon, where this is the compliance, compliance, and this is the stiffness. So for these, um, I had shown you kind of the general formulation for the anisotropic one, or the, the full anisotropic stiffness and strain tensors, which are kind of big and kind of gross and may have thrown some people off. So I was going to go through a couple examples just to show you how they actually would be used generally. So most of the time, like 90% of the time, your materials, you're going to assume that they're linear elastic isotropic unless you're dealing with composites um, or some strange class of, of highly anisotropic metals. Um, and so here are uh, isotropic formulations. We have an S is equal to 1 over E times some stuff. Uh, 1 minus nu minus nu. 1 minus nu, uh, da, da, da. 2 times 1 minus nu, 2 1 minus nu, 1 minus nu, these are all zeros here, and this is more zeros. Isn't 3, 3 supposed to be the other one as well? Yeah. Wait, so ah crap, yes, sorry. This is also a one, <laughs> which is very clear now. Um, this zero is just a three by three zero matrix because I don't want to write out a whole bunch of zeros. Uh, and the compliance tensor C is a little bit more gross. Uh, it was that E over one plus nu, one minus two nu, one minus new, 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 one minus new, do, 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 one minus two, new, over two, one minus two, new, over two. Zero, these are all zeros. Okay, so these were the the isotropic forms of the stiffness and compliance tensor. Yeah. For the compliance tensor, <coughs> shouldn't that be two times one plus new instead of two times one the matrix? Uh, in it should this one. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Clearly, you've already studied this more than I have. Um. Okay, so I wanted to show a couple general examples for how this actually comes in useful. So if we have, as probably the simplest case, do, 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 uh, uniaxial tension. So for uniaxial tension now, we have just a bar or a block or some shape that's getting stretched uniaxially with some stress sigma, which means our stress tensor is something sigma and a whole bunch of zeros, where this is equivalent to remember these are just our two different notations for, for the stress tensor here. 
uh, so that we can actually do matrix math with this one without worrying about 4D vector spaces. Um, so if I go and I multiply, so now I, I want to find my strain. I can take this sigma, multiply it into the compliance tensor here, and I would get sigma over e minus nu over e, or minus uh, 1 over e sigma minus nu, sigma minus nu, sigma, and then zeros. Which you may recognize as, this is just our Poisson's ratio contraction. But now we have kind of a simple, straightforward way of, of calculating the whole strain, strain tensor out from this one equation. So we have, if I just apply a single uniaxial stress and I multiply out by my stiffness tensor, or my compliance tensor, I get my strain out. So instead of saying, oh, right, there's, there's a Poisson's ratio here, and this is the strain in this direction, this is the strain in that direction, and I have to think about what's actually going on, you could just kind of multiply these matrices together, and the strain pops out. So there'd be a way to simplify these sorts of calculations. Um, another nice example, two, 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 I have uh, uniaxial uh, strain. Uniaxial strain. This is a slightly weirder one. So this is, if I want a body now to extend by given epsilon. So here, my strain tensor or my strain is just strain with some zeros in it. My stress, if I use this strain and I plug it into my stiffness tensor, the stress that pops out uh, is, uh, nope, don't want to do that. This is E over 1 plus nu, 1 minus 2 nu, uh, 1 minus nu epsilon, nu epsilon nu, zero, zero, zero. So where for the uniaxial tension case, this is saying, if I take a block and I stretch it out with some stress sigma, this turns into some strained body. It'll strain out. So this, this turns into our sigma over E and minus nu sigma over E. So it contracts in for uniaxial strain nu over E. Or for uniaxial stress, the, you get a Poisson's ratio uh, contraction. Here, if I, try, if I wanted to apply uniaxial strain, which is maybe slightly less intuitive, I'm saying if I try to strain my body out, do, 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 and apply a state of, of uniaxial strain. I have to apply a stress to this thing. In all these directions. So I have to be pulling on my sample in every in the in the transverse directions to actually get this simple strain state to happen. Now, if you remember, there's a couple or there's there's one relationship that you might remember. Um, that's our, our lambda, our Lamaze parameter, uh, is equal to nu e over 1 plus nu 1 minus 2 nu. And so here now you can actually see this is that term, nu e over 1 plus 2 nu 1 minus 1 plus nu 1 minus 2 nu. 
so here, if you if you remember in, in how we actually got that Lemay's parameter, this is this is basically that situation is applying a uniaxial strain while holding the sides fixed. So this is now some lambda epsilon, lambda epsilon, lambda epsilon. It turns out there's another quantity that's interesting that I didn't talk about because it's kind of a weird one, um, but it's it's an m, which is equal to one minus nu. E over one plus new, one minus two new, uh, which this is equal to. It's a it's a geological uh, constant normally, and it's it's for uh, P waves. If you're familiar with earthquakes at all, this is V P squared. This is P wave. So this is actually the, the P wave modulus. So a P wave is, is a pressure wave in a solid. So if you're familiar with earthquakes at all, the there's generally a pressure wave that shoots through at one speed and a shear wave that shoots through at another speed. So if you ever have an earthquake, there, there'll be two shocks because of those two different, the P wave and the S wave. Um, this quantity is basically the speed that a wave, or it directly relates to the speed that a wave travels through in a confined medium, which Earth normally is. So just because of the boundary conditions on the Earth, because of the soil surrounding it, you actually end up with something that's almost a pure strain condition. So this is now m epsilon, m epsilon, um, just so I don't have to write the whole thing out. Um, so that's actually a scenario where this comes in useful. But this, if you, if you apply uniaxial stress, you get kind of what you're familiar with. The, the body stretches out and it contracts due to Poisson's ratio contraction. This is maybe a very non-intuitive result for most people, um, or at least I wasn't as familiar seeing it. So um, here you have, this is, this is kind of a weird stress state that you have to apply to get this sort of uniaxial strain. And so this is where these sorts of equations come in particularly handy um, in, in finding these, these weird non-intuitive stress states where you can't necessarily immediately determine it from applying a uniaxial stress or biaxial stress state. Um, so, would you like me to show you another example of this, or do you feel like you have a good handle of it? Let's see, one person wants to show another example. More examples. All right, cool. So. Let's look at a biaxial stress state. Biaxial stress state. Where this is now, if I have my body, and I'm applying. some sigma, sigma out in these directions. Now my stress tensor, sigma, sigma, zero, everywhere else, which is equivalent to sigma, sigma, zeros, all the way down. If I wanted to calculate my strain now, this strain, uh, should I rewrite out the, uh, it's equal to, let's, sure, let's write it out. Um, damn it, there's an E here. One over E, oh, I should have done it the other way. Ah, uh, damn it. There's, there's one over E out front of this thing. Uh, da, 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 one minus new, minus new, new, one, one, minus new, new, zeros, two, one plus new, two, one plus new, two, one plus new, zeros, zeros, out everywhere else. Times sigma 
sigma zero. There we go. So now to get my strain out, I, I'm just multiplying these two matrices together. And so if I do that, if you remember matrix math, I'm taking this column, multiplying it over into the body, or into, into my matrix. Uh, I have my strain is one over E. This is now, uh, I'm gonna bring a, uh, I'll leave the sigma out. Um, one minus new times sigma, one again, one minus new times sigma, this is minus two new sigma, and then zeros for everything else. So this would be the resulting strain state from applying biaxial stress to a sample. Cool. Starting to feel a little more comfortable, hopefully. Okay, so from an engineering standpoint, a lot of the time we don't actually want to deal with this full 3D thing. This is basically, very rarely will you be doing hand calculations with a full anisotropic strain, strain or stiffness tensor. Most of the time this, you would find out quantities for a given material, what, what, their, what their constants are that would fit into the sensor, plug it into a finite element software, and it would pop out an answer for you on the strain in some complicated body. So this, these types of calculations work for very simple bodies, but most of the time it's difficult to work with things in three dimensions. Again, particularly useful when you start doing finite element calculations. So as engineers, again, we like simplifying things. So you remember, if you remember kind of previous mechanics classes, even in the beginning, we here, we talked a lot about 2D states of stress. So we kind of ignored the fact that the body was three dimensional and we said, all right, I'm just gonna pay attention to the stress and strain in maybe a 1D rod or, or a 2D, 2D block that's being sheared. And that's about as complicated as I'm gonna get. It turns out there's a few situations where that's actually reasonable. So those couple situations are, are called plane stress and plane strain. stress and plane strain. So here, this now, if I have a very thick body or a very thin body, do, do. maybe I don't want to do that. Let's just draw a block. Blocks are easier to draw. Or a very thick body. Then for each of these, one is so one, one of these bodies is plain stress, one of these bodies is plain strain. And in this, I'm going to say because of the geometry of the specimen, ignore either the stress in the through direction, so the, the either the stress in the through direction or the strain in the through direction, and say that those are equal to zero. Now, I'm going to have a little bit of an exercise for you guys. And I want you to try to think about which one would be which and why. Let's see if this goes. Oh. Cool. Yeah. It's been a little bit it's been a little bit of time since I did a poll. Gotta get those uh, class participation points. And in this one, I'm gonna ask. So would a, would a thick plate or a thin plate have a, specifically I'm just going to ask plain stress because the other one is the other way. Um, so here our, our plain stress condition, our, our sigma zz, which is now in the through direction here, 
or along the, the bar direction there is equal to zero. So the, the stress in that direction is zero, the shear in those directions is zero. Um, which one would, would a plane stress apply to, do you think, based on the boundary conditions here? So. Yeah. Can you still answer the poll if I switch back to this slide? Okay, cool. Oh, I didn't see this class is playing stress in the air. It's highly accurate. Mm, hopefully not too much. No, it's, it's incredibly accurate. <laughs> I'm not digging this class. <laughs> I'm having a really hard time. Yeah. I, yeah. I'll, I, I, I can try to help out. I mean, I might, that's uh, what I... I was going to ask if I could schedule like a, like a meeting to, yeah. to discuss some stuff. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Okay, let's see where we are. So, there's a little bit of disagreement, um, but generally a thin plate is, is the majority answer. So, what I'm going to have you do real quick <laughs> is turn to the person or people next to you and try to convince them one way or the other about your answer. So, uh, I guess 25-ish, maybe 10, 12 percent of the class said thick plate, 75 now is thin, uh, thin plate. Why, why would one be correct over the other? And I'm going to try this out as an experiment. Um, yeah, talk to the person next to you and, and see if you can convince them one way or the other. He said he has no idea, and I don't know. So I, I just guessed. I just gonna guess. I didn't quite hear the definition. Of that. Right. <laughs> I guess the answer that's also an easy way to figure it out. Okay, that's hopefully a good place to stop. Let's all come back together. Does, does anyone have a good answer about which one, which one would be a plain stress or plain stress strain condition? Which one of these would have a plain stress condition and why? Or no opinions. Yeah. The thin plate? Okay, why? Okay, so you, why can't you ignore the strain in the through direction there? Anyone else want to give it a shot at explaining? Any other thoughts?
Yeah, that is that is a good logical jump. Other thoughts? Okay. Yeah. So, both of you guys are right. Um, the the thin the thin walled structure is is the thin or the thin plate is does have a plane stress condition, and it's basically this this free boundary on the outside can't have if it doesn't have stress directly applied to it, the stress really can't develop internally inside of it in in that direction. So you know that if there's no applied boundary on this or if there's no applied force on this side, then there's no that then this is is free, and so the stress going through the thickness of this thing, the stress going through the thickness, uh, it doesn't really have, on, on one side is free and on the other side is free, so it doesn't really have enough enough spatial area to, to build up internally. Um, so, yeah, it, it very much applies to thin films, to pressure vessels, to any, any sorts of shell structures. Uh, I don't, we're probably not going to get into shell mechanics at all in this class, but uh, this is kind of a scenario where that simplification applies. Uh, later on, I think we'll talk about, we, or we will hopefully get to fracture, and in fracture problems, this is where uh, thin uh, plane versus plane strain conditions are actually very important. Um, yeah, cool. So then the other scenario, the other, uh, the other one is the is the plane stress condition, with the idea being that. There we go. Nope. That works. Around there. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, I switch to you. And that goes to nothing. Switch back to you. There we go. All right. Cool. So here, this this is our uh, plane stress, and this is our plane strain. So anytime you have a thin shell, a pressure vessel, a, a hollow tube, uh, and anything with a thin wall, you can generally ignore the stress, sigma z z, sigma z x, sigma z y is zero, uh, where I should have run a coordinate system here, which probably would have made things easier. This is the z x and y. Z is the through direction here. For our plane strain condition, we're going to assume that e z is e z x, e z y is equal to zero. So this is particularly applicable in very thick bodies. Think uh, like geological bodies. So so earthquakes. Uh, a plane strain condition would be, or for for wave propagation of earthquakes of earthquake waves through soil. A plane strain condition is is very commonly applied um, because basically there's because there's so much stuff in the through direction. The body it, it's difficult for the body to extend in that direction. Um, yeah, so there's a couple equations that follow out of this, uh, which I uh, don't really need to talk about too much. Um, so in the notes, I have the 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 simplifications to the stress and strain tensor for the for a plane stress and plane strain body, and you can take a look at those there. Um, but really quick to talk about the torsion test. So, last week you guys had the tensile lab. This week there is the torsion lab. So these kind of go hand in hand. Both of these you're applying some, you're, you're trying to measure if you apply a certain state of stress to a body, how does it deform it? And so now for the torsion lab, Torsion lab. We're gonna have uh, 
so I'm going to start with something here. Some bar uh, initial radius or outer radius R not length L here that I'm going to be applying some torque T to. When I apply that torque, this body is going to twist. Um, that twist is going to have some gamma. I'm going to twist total rod by some twist theta. Oh, let's see if this. Do you want to focus here? That's very out of focus. Camera's just kind of crapping out on me. Um, let's try turning it off. Uh, 